So with that, my name is Nina and I work in the Undergraduate Outreach and Recruitment Office with the Fulton School of Engineering. So my job is very much this, to interact with prospective students and parents and just help them get a little bit more information about what the Fulton School is all about. So I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'll be helping monitor the Q&A and running the chat. But our main speaker is Kate Sawyer. So Kay is the Associate oh, Director for Global Engagement and Inclusion here with the Fulton Schools. And she's prepared a wonderful presentation all about study abroad and really becoming a globally competent engineer. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kay and we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome, thank you, Nina, I appreciate it. Um, so I am so glad that all of you have found your way to this session. Um, and before I start, because I may be throwing some new information that you hadn't thought of when you thought of study abroad, I'd like to find out, you know, I hope this will this will work. I'd really like to find out how our participants today um, got interested in study abroad. So everyone has different experiences and if they're able to throw this in the Q&A, that'd be awesome. Um, but so I'll give you kind of a, my response to this. So how do you become interested in study, studying abroad or going abroad? Um, and really when I look back on it, I had some friends that were from um, another country when I was in elementary school. And I learned a lot about um, differences in the way they ate and some of their entertainment, um, the language that they spoke. Um, and as you know, a kindergartner learned a few words. And I think that kind of stayed with me and made me very interested in, in other cultures and had other experiences as I grew up. So if they're able to, I would be very interested to see and um, what brought you here? What made you interested in learning more about study abroad? Hey, you're welcome to type in that that q a we can have that interaction this way so really anything if um what you're what really has inspired you and put it in the q a and i'll shout it out to kay to kind of start our conversation so okay the q a i think shows up as a big gray box when you're presenting so i'm not sure if you want to close out of that and then i can help share if you see anything uh, am, am i moving it around too much <laughs> no no it, it popped up a big gray box in the middle of your screen, I think, when you're trying to look at the q and Okay. All right, so one of our participants says, I love traveling to and experiencing new places. That is a really wonderful reason for getting interested in study abroad, absolutely. So hopefully we can share some insight into some of those exciting places that you might consider. Awesome, and that's, that's very typical. Um, many students who, um, are interested in study abroad, they've lived abroad or they have family um, or they themselves have come from other places or they've had opportunities to learn languages, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of learning opportunities that you have when you study abroad. And one of the things that I want to really sort of focus on initially in this presentation is why it's important for those of you who have chosen engineering and technical careers um, to think about study abroad as well as other opportunities. So that's why we've um, entitled this study abroad and beyond. So study abroad is one way that we can gain global competencies. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so we're gonna talk about lots of different types of opportunities and what um, why it's important as an engineering student. So we... Go ahead, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry? I was just going to say, we've got a couple other great responses that chime into that. So oh, awesome. One student that says, I want to be able to work in another country and learn a new language, which is definitely something you're going to cover. And then another participant says, to broaden my educational experience. So it sounds like everyone has found themselves into the perfect webinar for those interests. Awesome, thank you, Nina. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm going to. So this is, these are the topics that we're gonna cover today. 
Um, and then, like Nina said, we're going to answer um, any questions that you have, but we're going to talk about global competencies for engineers. And that's kind of a really big topic, but essentially it's those competencies, so you've talked about working and living abroad, that will help you to interact in environments and situations that are um, that are global in nature. So it might mean um, intercultural communication, um, different work teams, that kind of thing, um, but developing those competencies so that you can be effective in those areas. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the research around that and what engineers in the global engineering arena are saying about that. Then we're gonna talk about study abroad. Sometimes we call it study away. Um, there's another term that um, is starting to be very common mobility programs. So um, it might be, you know, there might be a global opportunity, but you stay in the United States, but mobility programs will take you around the world. Um, then we'll uh, focus a little bit on language study and why that also can help you develop global competencies. And then there's a few other opportunities, um, such as clubs and organizations, courses you can take and workshops. And we'll just touch briefly on those. So when we talk about global um, competencies or engineering global competencies, um, those that I work with, we, we've kind of um, adopted this. We really like this statement um, because it helps us focus on not only engineering competencies, but global, and it just brings it all together. So this is a researcher that's done a lot of work on why it's important for engineers to um, have these international experiences and develop um, global competencies. Um, he says that learning to work effectively with people who define problems differently than oneself, and that encapsulates what global engineering competency is. So if you think about engineering and the kinds of things that you want to study and that you're going to be learning, um, it's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of trying to figure out um, in different communities um, what um, your designs or your solutions are going to bring to that community or that situation. And so being able to talk and work with people who may be thinking about it differently than you do is really important. So this next slide kind of says the same thing. So um, you may at some point hear about ABET. ABET's the organization that um, provides um, accreditation or um, that, that certifies an engineering program with that um, you're learning the right things. And so they come in and they say ASU is teaching you the right things. Um, and they have a statement that includes global competencies and their statement is engineering students should show the broad education necessary to understand the impact of engineering solutions in a global economic, environmental and societal context. So that's a whole lot of stuff, right? Um, that's, you know, everything contextual that you will be dealing with, whether you're going into biomedical or construction or whatever your um, area of expertise is going to be, being able to situate um, your solutions um, where they are needed and where they're going to be implemented is going to be really critical. So um, ABET wants ASU to be teaching you these things. And so again, um, these international um, study abroad opportunities, they're all going to be very important. So going to kind of blow you away with this one, but this is another researcher and we really like what he says as well. So he talks about what those specific competencies are um, that engineers need in order to be successful um, working around the world um, or solving problems through engineering solutions. Um, and I'm not going to really go through all of these, but we'll throw a couple of these out um, and you can kind of look at them. Um, but this researcher says that engineers need to be able to, of course, communicate across cultures, um, as you will quickly find in your education career, as well as in your career um, as a professional, that you'll be interacting with people who speak different languages, um, with people who come from different uh, cultural backgrounds. So being able to effectively communicate is really critical. And so I kind of put that front and center. Um, that's one of the most important um, aspects. 
Um, you'll also see, um, I'm going to look slightly to the left here. Um, we want to be familiar with history, government, and economic systems. So think about that. Um, this, um, this scholar who um, is a, a global engineering scholar um, uses a, a diagram of a jet airplane, which I think is Boeing, and he picks it all apart um, and looks at all the different pieces and parts that go into making that jet airplane. And they come from countries all around the world. So there's expertise on different components that come from um, countries all around the world on every continent. Um, so it's very interesting to think about how important it is to understand the systems that uh, these component parts are coming from. Um, and how critical that is as an engineer for you to understand that. Um, we also talk a little bit about languages. So some people may become very, pro uh, very proficient at a professional level, but even at a conversational level or learning a language will help you to develop those competencies um, in that communication arena. Um, it helps to um, build bridges as you try to um, learn the language of the culture that you're working in or multiple cultures that you may be working in. Um, let me see if I can pick out another couple. Um, so understanding the connectedness up there in the upper right hand corner of the global economy. So everything's connected and then just below it, um, there are important aspects of supply chain management and law, legal things like intellectual property and different business practices. Um, and the more you develop global competencies and are able to operate within these multiple contexts, the more successful as an engineer you'll be. So that's kind of the exciting part. And now I'm going to go to the next part, which uh, is sometimes hit, the reality of it hits us. Um, and it can really be a challenge for engineering students. And I want that, you know, we, we encourage you and we want to find every way that we can to um, offer opportunities. But there are particular challenges for students in engineering and technical fields um, that they have to kind of overcome um, or at least be aware of as you're navigating the complexity of your academic career. So um, this is sort of the list of, of things you might run it, you know, and we all have our own personal obstacles, maybe obligations that we have on a personal level that can um, feed into this as well. Um, but these obstacles include the rigor of the curriculum. So, you know, you've got to be good at, at very tough subjects at math and physics and all of these things. And so the curriculum of engineering can sometimes be an obstacle. And so that's something that you just need to be aware of. And so you're thinking about it at the right time, um, just as you're beginning, just as you're thinking about the classes that you need to take. Um, and just being aware that that curriculum is, is a tough one um, and to make the accommodations that you can. Um, lack of tradition. So just generally in engineering curricula uh, itself, there's not a long history of studying abroad um, as there is in other fields like humanities or social sciences. Um, and so it's relatively new um, in engineering and in engineering at ASU. Um, sometimes lack of support. Um, and like I said, that support can be everywhere. Maybe it's you know financial and we've got financial restrictions on here as well. Um, so um, you kind of have to be a little bit, um, a, a little bit risk taking um, when you're thinking about this, but it can be done. So financial restrictions, sometimes transferring credit is challenging. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about the types of programs. Um, sometimes there's negative perceptions about studying abroad. Um, difficulty in recruiting and a lack of cultural preparedness. So. I'm throwing that out, put that in the back of your mind as you're starting to think about this and plan for your study abroad experience. Uh, just know that there will be obstacles and hopefully if you are um, undeterred, you'll find the resources that you need. 
Um, that's part of what my, my job is, is we've got loads of resources, your academic advisors, financial support, the study abroad office. And so my job is to kind of help you navigate through that and find the resources that you need. Um, so, so far, any questions? None so far, but just a good reminder, if you do have questions as we go through this presentation, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, and then we can either address them in the middle of the presentation or hold it to the end. So ask questions. Thank you. So I'm going to go on to kind of what hopefully everyone sort of has in their mind about what traditional study abroad opportunities are. And these are still kind of the um, meat and potatoes, the nuts and bolts of study abroad opportunities. Um, we'll talk about um, some recent changes. As we know, um, COVID-19 has changed um, everything about going to school and traveling, um, but wanted to make you aware that these are still the basic types of programs that are offered through ASU and pretty typically at, at most universities. Um, so just to kind of be aware of um, the timeframes and the types of programs that are offered. So the first one that I have here is a faculty directed program. And I'm going to talk about this um, with the global intensive program, global, global intensive experiences, because there's some similarities. There's also some differences. So a faculty directed program is usually a short term program, and it often takes place during the summer. So it's going to be anywhere from 10 days to possibly eight weeks, depending on the program. Um, they're typically credit bearing and they're led by a faculty member, which is really great because that gives you the opportunity to really get to know the faculty member um, as you're having that experience. So um, like I said, they usually take place during the summer, although sometimes there are um, faculty directed programs that take time take place at other times of the year it's usually easiest for students during the summer um, and you do get that credit um, I I'll also say that we have limited opportunities right now in engineering of course because of COVID and some other things we're hoping that when by the time you're ready to go we've got some additional opportunities um, but you should also be looking for uh, faculty directed programs and some of these other programs, um, but mainly faculty directed programs that may not be taught within engineering, but will still provide you with the opportunity to to travel to learn about a new culture to perhaps learn a new language to learn some new skills. Those are still valuable to you and you will be able to use what you've learned. Um, in your career as a professional engineer. So if you see limited program, limited opportunities right now, know that more are coming and also think more broadly about um, what opportunities you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for, you know, you're very interested in what's going on in Germany right now. Um, and, and there's maybe programs there that aren't necessarily engineering, but will give you that background um, on what's going on in Germany and German history and that kind of thing, which will add to your experience. So that's the faculty director program. Again, short term, led by a faculty member, usually 10 days to eight weeks. So global intensive experience is similar, but a global intensive experience is connected to a semester course. So for example, we have an EPICS course that has run a global intensive experience. So hopefully you will be or are learning about the EPICS course. So you take a semester class and then either in the middle of that class during a spring break or at the end of the class or um, at the beginning of summer or winter, um, there's different models, um, but that's the time when the mobility program takes place. So you'd have a regular course on the ASU campus or through ASU sync and then have this component that would be usually those are a little bit shorter 10 days to three weeks. Um, that would be part of your semester course. These are also faculty led um, why these are a little bit different is that you don't need to pay the extra tuition so faculty-led programs 
If they're during the summer, you do pay for the summer tuition, but the global intensive experience is attached to that semester course. So you've already paid the tuition there and you would only pay the, the program fees for the global intensive experience. So again, look for those opportunities. Um, and we'll go on to a partnership program. So partnership program is um, it, what we call third party programs. So there's a wide variety of different programs um, and they might be semester long, they might be short term, but these are usually offered from other institutions or companies that um, specialize in study abroad opportunities. So um, through the study abroad office at ASU, they have catalogs and loads of information about um, these different kinds of programs that are partnership programs taught outside of ASU, um, but sometimes you can get credit for them at ASU. Um, again, if you're not getting credit for it, there's still value in that, but as students, um, that's gonna be important, important questions for you to ask is, is it credit bearing? Can I get ASU credit for it? Um, so partnership programs outside of ASU. Um, so exchange programs is the next one. Exchange programs, um, that's when we have an ASU partnership with usually another university. So like, let's say we've got a partnership with a university in Italy. And this is an exchange program because the students at the university in Italy come to ASU to study and ASU students go to their university to study. Um, so, and that, those are usually for a semester or for an academic year, and they're based usually on specific majors. Um, so we do have some um, exchange programs there. These can be kind of tricky because they're only offered, it's an exchange program and it's, an, it's a partnership between ASU and other universities. So they're only offered if we get students going both ways. So the more students that we have in our partnership programs that we're sending abroad, um, the more that they're able to send students to us and it keeps everybody happy and we're able to continue with the, with the exchange program. Um, so the final one is internships um, and there are lots of different models. Um, they, it could be a full-time internship. It could be a course that you take that includes an internship component, um, but um, hopefully you're aware of internships and the value that they are, particularly to engineering students. It gives you work experience. It gives you experience in global industries. Um, again, there, you know, it might not necessarily be in your engineering field. I know of a, an engineering student that I worked with. Um, she was really awesome. She went on um, a program that was taught out of another college to Beijing for the summer. And she was able to get um, an internship with a with a, an, an, an engineering um, company, um, and I think that they were I think they were four or six week internships, and she had a really great um, experience. That's not always guaranteed that you can be in just the right company that you want, um, but um, sometimes those are available and she had this great experience. And again, that was taught outside of Fulton. So um, again, just encouraging you um, as you start your search within the next couple of years to think more broadly um, about opportunities that are out there that may be of great value to you. So that in a nutshell is our study abroad programs that we offer um, at ASU, kind of the traditional programs. Um, any questions so far? So and I'm not sure if this is something you're gonna cover later in the presentation, if so, we can hold it. But we have a couple questions about funding. So one of them being what scholarships are available for study abroad, and then within the study abroad costs, what sorts of things entail personal costs and if those are optional. So those are a couple of questions you have so far. Okay, awesome. I'm going to answer these really quickly because those are really good questions that you should keep on your list as you're as you're investigating. So the first one, um, uh, was it scholarships? scholarships. I'm sorry. Yeah, scholarships for study abroad. Okay, scholarships. So yes, the study abroad office um, has a number of different scholarships. 
Um, and you can go on their website, um, and maybe you can drop this into the chat. It's studyabroad.asu.edu. Um, and, and look at the scholarships that they have there, and they have several different ones. On their site, they also have links to additional scholarships that are available. The Fulton office, and this is a scholarship that, that I help to manage, we also have one. Um, so um, you, can, you can apply for that. You usually need to have applied and been accepted into a program in order to apply for the, for the Study Abroad Scholarship and for the Fulton Scholarship, but those are available to you. Um, besides the ones, the Study Abroad Office is going to be the best resource for you, um, but there are others out there and we highly encourage you to look for any opportunities that um, are there for, for scholarships. Um, so um, yes, there are scholarship funds. And what was this, the next question? Yeah, so I, I put the, the two links in the chat. So the general study abroad through ASU, I've included that link in the chat, what Kay was mentioning for scholarship searches. And I've also included the Fulton one as resources for you. Um, the second question related to funding was when looking at the costs for a study abroad, what entails personal costs and are those optional? Okay, good question. So personal costs are going to be anything above and beyond what the program details will they will provide. And so that's going to be things like, um, you know, sometimes it's meals that are not provided in the program if you want to go out with friends and are spending you know, it's not it's not part of the program. So, or souvenirs or additional travel. So sometimes at the beginning or the end of a program, some students want to take advantage of being in, let, let's say, Europe, um, and there are other countries there that you want to see. So anything that's above and beyond what is detailed there. Um, so usually most of these programs um, will include almost everything. Um, there, you know, you'll need to provide your passport. Um, it you're typically you'll typically need to um, to uh, purchase your own airline ticket because students will be coming and going at different times. So it's often the airline ticket as, as well. Um, in fact, I don't believe that the study abroad office does include those. So that's something that you need to be um, need to be thinking about is, and and looking for scholarships for those types of things. So. Um, again, most of the programs from the beginning to the end of the program themselves will include um, most, if not all, of your basics like lodging and um, trips that are included in, as part of the program, like if you're going on field trips and things like that. Um, but anything beyond what they detail, you'll need to you'll need to be prepared for. So that's an awesome question, and that goes to um, the the issue of financial constraints. So something to be thinking about from the very beginning. Okay, any other questions right now? I have one that popped up. So um, when is the best time to plan for a study abroad? So if a student is expecting to attend ASU for four years, do you have recommendations on when's a really good time for study abroad? Awesome question. Um, and the, the answer to that is it depends. So what I would highly, highly, highly recommend is um, during your early appointments with your academic advisor that you tell your academic advisor that you are interested in doing a study abroad and reach out to the study abroad office as well. So that academic advisor, because all the programs are very different, all your academic programs are gonna be different. And there are, um, so, so and, and the types of programs that are available are gonna be different. Typically for engineering students, because internships may be a very important part of your curricul curriculum, we recommend um, early in your, in your academic career. So you can go as early as after your freshman year. Um, after the sophomore year is a good time to go as well. As you get, as you move towards um, graduation, your, um, your classes are gonna get tougher. You may need to take summer classes. You may be getting those internships that are really critical as well. 
Um, and that's why we want to get this messaging out there to you early so that if you're really serious about that, you work with your academic advisor to pick out the right time and the right program for you. If you think about it after your freshman year, after your sophomore year, you may not have the time to get it in there um, to get it scheduled. So you guys are thinking about these questions at an awesome time. So think about study abroad, depending on the type of study abroad, but as early as you can, so you're not missing out on those other opportunities. And um, you're integrating that at a time when um, you're not thinking so much about maybe internships and other things um, that are coming up. So, so ask questions early. Um, make sure that your academic advisor knows um, early on that you're interested. Um, so that they can help. They know the obstacles. Um, so they can um, talk to you about um, your particular program. Um, and then um, go to the City Abroad office. The City Abroad office, they've got lots of peer mentors. They've got coordinators who know our Fulton students really, really well. And they know, again, some of the challenges that you're going to be facing. Um, and so, you know, take the initiative to to look to those resources as early as possible. That's some really good advice. I think that wraps up for our questions at this point in time. So I'm sure we'll have to come up. Okay, awesome. So I think we've got videos, if I'm not mistaken. So we wanted you to hear from some students who, some Fulton students who have um, studied abroad. And so I have a couple of videos that we'll share with you. and. Again, if you've got any thoughts or questions that come up as you're watching these videos, let us know. If I can get this to work. Oh. Okay, I'm clicking too many things here. Sorry about that. There we go. My name is Katherine Hamzachek. I'm studying biomedical engineering and I studied abroad for a semester in Cape Town, South Africa. It was absolutely incredible. I went to study for a semester and was, uh, was really excited to be able to take classes at the, the local university. That was a, a big part of the experience that I wanted to be able to have was being able to take classes with, with local students. We happened to be in Victoria Falls on the, the same night as the full moon there. I think my, my favorite overall was being the opportunity to be able to meet the people that I did and that was both people locally but also uh, the other really cool people that were there also studying abroad. It's incredible how close you can get to people over, over the course of just, just a semester. And I'm absolutely glad that I went on my trip. I would, I haven't regretted it ever for an instant and wouldn't have traded that experience for anything. My name is Nikhil Selvam. I'm a computer science and economics double major. I was in London for a summer um, doing some school there and uh, you know covering the Olympics a little bit. I was in Singapore for an academic year, really honing in on my computer science skills. And then I was in India the following summer doing some uh, HIV AIDS prevention teaching. I learned as much in those 15 months as I did in the 18 or 19 years of my life before that. Uh, and I have just as many memories because when you're abroad, literally every day is an adventure. So I think I mainly learned to be independent and I really just learned to enjoy every day, which I think here you get caught up in, yeah, you know, I'm just going to classes or whatever else. I'm here around my family, which I always am. You kind of devalue every day. But when I went abroad, I realized every day is like really incredible. I would say a lot of people, one, are afraid of falling behind classes and things like that. That's valid, but I think you can structure it in such a way, especially if you do an exchange program where your classes are counting equally there and here at ASU. So I think that's a big thing. And second, in terms of cost, that can be also a very viable you know, reason not to go, but the study abroad office is usually pretty good about hand helping you at least think about uh, expenses. I think a lot of people just think, it's study abroad, it's expensive, I'm not even gonna go check it out. But I think that is 
you know, a problem. That's something I don't want people to do because you miss out on great opportunities. Specifically with exchange programs, you pay the same that you pay at ASU. The only difference is you pay for your plane ticket and maybe some additional fees. So you're really not paying that much more than you already would have, especially if you can get some scholarships on your way out there. The biggest thing is, you know, you learn from a lot of different people and you learn a lot about the world itself in a way that just being at ASU or just anywhere in particular won't teach you. So I think the big thing is to just do it. Any questions after looking at those videos? I, I love talking and hearing from our students who study abroad. Um, they, you know, you know you're going to learn things, but being in a completely new environment, it can be very transformative, both professional, uh, academically, professionally, and personally. So um, again, it's great to hear from them. Any additional questions? I'm just yet, but go ahead and ask away. Anyone that's in our, our audience pool, we're here to help answer any questions you have. Sorry, Nina, I didn't quite get that. Sorry, my audio is cutting out a little bit. We don't have any questions just yet, but feel free to ask away if you happen to think of any as we go through this material. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to shift a little bit we have i mean we've talked about really traditional programs um, and i'll encourage you to go to that study abroad link um, they have loads of um they have like um what am i thinking of sorry my mind just went blank but they have like webinars that you can attend and info sessions and all kinds of resources um, to help and encourage you. So I would, you know, when you have some time, just go to that website and explore it so that you get familiar with the resources and then just get familiar with the folks over in the, in the study abroad office. So, um, so I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about something really brand new um, from the study abroad office. And you'll find this on their website as well. So because we have had this wonderful pandemic that we've all been impacted by um, over the last year or so, um, it has um, put many, many of our offices and um, opportunities and certainly the study abroad, study abroad office in a position to be very innovative about how we deliver programs. So, um, and just so you know, um, most of the programs for this summer are mo most likely not going to run um, because, um, because of the pandemic and because of wanting to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, that doesn't mean that they're all closed down. Um, there will be some where um, the, the experts with the study abroad office and our, um, the contacts that they work with um, deem that it's safe. And so there are still some oppor awesome opportunities that are happening. Um, but in order to provide some opportunities um, for students who are not able to go on mobility programs or those programs that actually go abroad and travel, um, they put together what they're calling Global Innovation Summer. Um, and like many things that have been innovative during the pandemic, these opportunities are mo most likely going to stay. Um, so there'll be an alternative if you find that, you know, maybe study abroad didn't work out for you or you'd like to take advantage of different kinds of programs in addition to study abroad, um, these opportunities um, will most likely um, be further developed, but they are being offered for this summer. So you can, if you want to find out about what's happening this summer, you can go on the website and look up Global Innovation Summer, which I think is on their main page. Um, and these are the different programs. So global tech programs, um, those are focused on developing particular technical, um, technical skills such as data analytics or working with Tableau, that type of thing. Um, again, during the summer, and these are all virtual. Um, there is the Oper Oper Entrepreneurship Challenge Week, which you will be working, or the students that participate um, will be working with a global business um, on a particular challenge. Um, and they will be working in teams and then they'll actually make a pitch. Um, and this summer, I think they're working with Hewlett Packard um, and they'll make a pitch and they'll, um, they, 
they have the opportunity to win an award where they would be included on um, on a tour of their headquarters. So there's a that that's a real um, an interesting run one because it's providing a future opportunity to to be connected with that industry. Um, so that's becoming very popular. Um, global virtual internships. That's one that I'm working with, and so students apply for this. Um, and they indicate what type of internship they're working, they're, they're interested in. So let's say, you know, going back again to maybe biomedical, you're interested in working with a biomedical industry. And then we work with an outside um, company who will locate internships. Some of those may be very related to um, your academic area, they might be a little bit less so, and then you have the opportunity of accepting that internship or not. It just depends. So it's kind of like a matchmaking um, for those internships. Um, but, but again, they are offering internships that are global in, in nature. So there are companies that, that operate globally. Um, and then the European Innovation Academy. Um, this one is uh, I'm a little less familiar with this, but I think it's very, it's a, it's also an entrepreneurship opportunity um, where uh, the participants will work with different entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and working together on ideas that could um, be maybe a startup in the future. So you're actually working on the solution to problems. So I encourage you to kind of look at these opportunities as well. Um, if you do, again, find challenges fitting study abroad into your, um, into your academic career, think broadly. Um, and this is why we kind of wanted to start with the global competencies. So um, study abroad is one avenue, but there's lots of different opportunities that can lead to your development of of good connections, of being able to communicate with others, working on teams, um, learning about um, other companies and countries and, and um, how corporations and um, different engineering projects work in those in those areas. So um, keep this also in your mind as you're as you're making decisions. Um, another area. I want you to encourage, to encourage you to also think about is language study. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, learning another language um, opens lots of doors. Um, even if you don't become proficient enough to be a translator or an interpreter, um, learning a language helps you to start thinking about things differently. Um, it is a skill to be able to uh, communicate in another language, even if just on a conversational level. Um, so I've worked in the area of languages for a long time, and I um, I just saw a post from a former colleague of mine that says, even if you just know a few words in another language, you are multilingual um, because you've started to think about things in a different way. And that's part of those global competencies that are very important to develop. Um, so there's lots of ways at ASU to study languages. You can do it in the traditional way where you um, take, the, take the courses and either major or minor in those languages. And our language department here um, can help you with that, which is really awesome. There are also um, language, study, language study abroad opportunities as well. So again, if you're interested in that particular area, you can look for language learning opportunities as well. Um, I want to highlight one in particular um, because, um, number one, they're very interested in um, having more STEM students participate, but also because these are short-term programs. Um, and that's through what's called the Malikian Center or the Critical Languages Institute. And they teach languages that are less commonly taught. Um, here's a list um, of those that they teach. And these are um, summer programs. Uh, and many of them involve um, international travel. Um, so um, if you participate in these programs, you might have the opportunity then to apply for the component that takes you to these areas where these languages are spoken. 
Um, so this is another really great opportunity. So this is the Critical Languages Institute. Um, so keep that in mind. Again, less commonly learned. And so as you are, you know, if you're interested in um, Uzbek, for example, um, and are learning that language, it gives you a leg up for opportunities that might come for to participate in pro and in projects um, that might need those language skills. Um, and again, any language skills helps you to develop those intercultural um, competencies and awarenesses. So um, explore that. I have, I think, what's our time? I think I'm gonna show just one, one video um, from the Critical Languages Institute just to kind of in introduce this. Irina at the beginning and said, hey, look, if this is online, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And she said, well, you know, I think this is our only option at this point. Give it a try. And I'm so grateful that I jumped in and did it because online learning offers this new array of possibilities, right? You can more easily integrate certain learning experiences. You can reach out to people across a broader geographic divide. We could all come together with this common goal of learning more about this culture and this language. I really didn't expect, especially in a virtual platform, to get much speaking experience. And I kind of expected that I would mostly just be getting kind of grammar lessons and a lot of reading comprehension thrown at me. But by far, what I would really compliment, specifically our instructor, but also the entire CLI program, you know, how well I was able to get a lot of that confidence in speaking in our Polish class. Uh, the very first thing we did for the first about 45 minutes to an hour every day was just oral exercises, practicing and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. I would say that there was not a wasted minute in our Zoom class. We had a blackboard on Google, but it was something that we all were expected to have open when we started class. When we went through homework, we would say our answers so that everyone could hear them, but then we would type our answer into the Google Doc so that we could all see it and we could fix mistakes. And it actually was really useful for studying for quizzes and tests because it stayed as a living document. How do you spell Nijinli again? Is it like this? Is that, no. um, well, you can spell check it. There we go. One thing that really helped me was getting a few phone numbers from a few of the other kids, you know, and texting. Tons of text back and forth exchange between me and in particular one other student. We're pen pals now, actually. We, we pen pal in Persian now. I'm not kidding. Yeah, it's a real thing now. I unfortunately had a couple medical issues to deal with. Because it was an online format exclusively from the jump, being able to catch up on work being able to ask questions. Can we jump on a Zoom call? I mean, it's so much easier. The connectivity with the professors and also that I could reach out to my peers via the online tools we had, that was extremely helpful. I really established a sense of community and I knew these people and yet I've never seen them before in front of my eyes. In terms of the extracurriculars offered, that went far above and beyond my expectations. Really interesting speakers, really innovative speakers, and then the culture nights really affording great opportunities to get to know students and other programs. And I would really compliment the CLI with organizing those as well. The focus of Arizona State University, which is really interesting and makes the program very unique, is that it's not just focusing on the language, it's language and culture. So on Fridays, we had someone in the country of origin, which was Iran. One of his colleagues took us around via Zoom on her phone, the tomb of Hafez, a famous Iranian poet, live. And you're looking at this country, like where the skies are blue, these like cypress trees. And, you know, she's like just approaching people and being like, can I see this? And so many questions came up. They, oh, what are you eating? What is this ice cream? Oh, who knows how to say ice cream? You know like little things like that. I can tell you that hour was just so surreal. Seeing that welcoming atmosphere, I don't know, it's just, it really touches your soul. This has been one of the better language experiences that I've ever had, even in the classroom. I feel like I learned a lot more in two months than I did in a whole semester. This is the most intensive, this was more immersive than being in Rome, Italy. Let's be honest. 
day three of the course, I was thinking in Russian. That's how immersive this program is. For me, as a single parent, having the opportunity to have my daughter here with me and it, it still participate, just thank you all so much because this was the opportunity of a lifetime and it's going to be the beginning of a lifelong adventure. And I'm so grateful. Salam, Mushiri, Chetori. Khuba, merci. Cheno maski sarat dari. Vale, vale. Maske so se no radari. Maske surat as kharhani and misurani. So that actually was a different one that I wanted to show you, but I want, uh, but I'm glad I showed you that. Um, and just to mention, they. Um, so typically, this program has been um, in. Like I said, there's a there's a mobility component to it, um, but they were able to have a very successful year last summer. Um, as you can see, the students were very very excited about it. So. Um, so just towards the end, I just want to share with you a couple of other opportunities. Again, if the goal is global competencies, study abroad is one tool, um, that, but there are others. Um, and there are many um, ASU clubs and organizations that are focused on cross-cultural and intercultural exchanges um, and community building across campus. Um, and I've got a list here. I'll kind of just um, rattle off some of these, but you can... Um, search out clubs and opportunities. Um, and again, this is another way that you can start to build um, global competencies and um, and those networks um, across cultures. So there's Arab, Arabic language and culture club, um, German Devil, devils, global Council of diplomats, um, coalition of international students, Chinese, ling, uh, Chinese English language bridge. Um, I think just about you know any major language that you can think of, there are clubs um, associated with it and international student clubs. And so this is another thing that I would encourage you to, to get involved in if that is where your interest is. So, um, so check out ASU clubs and organizations. Um, also, um, as you're selecting your general studies classes, there are a lot of multicultural and global related classes. Um, and so think about this. Again, this is something to talk to advisors about, um, about opportunities um, that uh, for, for taking classes that um, will, you know, are credit bearing classes, but again, um, that you can choose from that will provide those opportunities to um, think about cross-cultural um, cross issues, diversity issues, um, language issues. So explore classes that um, might be in that vein as well. Um, and then university campuses are a great opportunity to seek out events and workshops um, to learn in other ways um, beyond the classroom. So I'm um, just again encouraging you to keep that global mindset and look for those opportunities to make those connections in, in any way that, that ASU has to provide. Um, so um, making it happen, um, again, just underscoring, make sure that you meet with your academic advisor who's going to be, um, you know, will help to, to talk you through those obstacles as well as opportunities. Make sure you visit the study abroad office. Um, they love Fulton students there. They understand the particular challenges that you're facing. Um, use, the, use the study abroad website to explore those opportunities. Um, and seek out financial resources early. And we talked about some of those, the study abroad office um, and the study abroad website um, are a good place to start for that. So um, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, I want you to keep thinking about, maybe you can write this down, um, someplace that you can go back to it when it's time to be making these decisions. How will you engage? And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, so think about study abroad opportunities, but also think about what is beyond study abroad um, and what can help you to um, develop those global competencies, um, build bridges, learn about new people, um, meet new people, um, and begin to make those connections that are gonna be important to you professionally and personally. So that's about all I have. Thank you so much, Kay. That was really helpful information. It's great to think about it from that big picture perspective about the different ways to get engaged globally, not just automatically thinking only study abroad, but there's a lot out there. 
one of the nice things about being such a large public institution, ASU has a lot of resources and opportunities. So we really encourage you to check those out. So that concludes um, our information for this session, but we'll stick around for the next five minutes until four o'clock to help answer any questions that you might have. Um, so my kind of parting last words is, as admitted students, you've got a really big decision ahead of you about where you want to go to college and what programs you want to pursue. Just know that we within the Fulton Schools, we're here to help answer any questions that you have. So anything um, admissions related within Fulton, you can reach out to me and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but then as you're planning any global uh, engagement, you can also reach out to our study abroad office. So we are all here to help answer any questions you have. If you've gotten what you need from our session today, you're more than welcome to log off, but we'll stick around for the next few minutes to help answer any questions.